All right, so first and foremost, I got to get it out of the way. My laptop is, for some reason, the screen is just going black every time I uh, record audio with it. No matter what different method medium I use, the screen just goes black. So I have to turn this in through an unusual format because all the audio was recorded off my phone. With that out of the way, uh, I'm Zach Richards. This is my curriculum final, and it's based off of a potential AP US history course. All right, so my introduction, I, uh, I went to Ohio University as an undergraduate. I have a bachelor's in history that I got about a year ago. And of course, I've been uh, doing my ongoing participation in this campus through its uh, master's program, but I'm taking uh, my master's in education for integrated social studies, seven through 12. If everything goes according to plan, I will graduate next May. And ultimately the goal of this and the undergrad, of course, was to be a high school or middle school history teacher, preferably high school, but I'll be qualified to teach middle school too. And in a couple weeks, I will start mentor teaching at uh, Federal Hawking High School. I don't have any real teaching experience, but I do have experience leading, um, leading high school and middle age youth through, my, uh, through the youth group I grew up in. Ever since I graduated high school, I've been going back whenever I can. Uh, to help volunteer for that. I've led plenty of activities. I've led through five mission trips. That's my main experience uh, leading youth at that age. And, you know, that's ultimately what inspired me to get into teaching. Federal Hawking High School is where I've been assigned to start mentor teaching in a couple weeks. It's about um, 20 minutes east of here. It's located in Stewart. And, uh, you know, having talked to my mentor teacher, he's He's given me a lot of the information about this that they have recently transitioned from block to bell schedule. Um, in the past, the curriculum was definitely based on more progressive elements, though a new principal has taken over a couple years ago. He's been transitioning them uh, back to a more traditional curriculum, though it still right now is a mix of both. According to the Ohio School Report Card, uh, there are 226 students enrolled. There's an 88.3% attendance rating. 89% four-year graduation rate, 12 to 18 students per teacher, depending on the grade, freshman through senior. And ultimately, the uh, uh, the school does offer an American history course for sophomores. I'm going to be uh, student teaching three of those in this upcoming uh, school year, but they do not offer any AP classes. Um, right now, I, am, I understand that it's because of the lack of resources, and uh, most of the students who prepare for college just um, do college credit plus through Ohio University anyway. But this is a hypothetical AP course for students who want an alternative. If they, uh, I believe that a course like this could be helpful for anyone who wants to be prepared for college without necessarily you know, leaving a classroom they're familiar with, leaving a setting they're familiar with. So this is a... Uh, this is a proposal for a new AP U.S. history course. Just reading off this slide real quick, my teaching philosophy is that I view teaching as a partnership and not an authoritarian position. Just as the students learn from me, I will learn from them. I want my position to be one that enables learning instead of forcing it, fostering discussion and critical thinking among the students instead of them simply regurgitating whatever I say. Not everyone has the same passion for history that I do, but by involving students in the classroom process, I hope to engage them and make them feel invested in their outcomes. So basically, you know, to elaborate on this a little bit, you know, when I think about which teachers I had growing up who I liked the most, uh, you know, I didn't learn the most from every teacher I liked the most, uh, but I definitely liked the, all the teachers I learned the most from because, uh, you know, people, it's, it's not mutually exclusive. You can have fun and, uh, and teach the students, you know, if you, when you teach the students in an engaging way, it helps them. Uh, it helps them learn without even really realizing they're learning. I think, and ultimately, the learning has to be the main. The main goal. The fun is kind of something else. But you've got to be engaging, and while fostering all this critical thinking and everything, you know, I I want to be an authority without being authoritarian. I, they obviously got to, they got to respect my leadership position. But ultimately, I want them to be involved with the classroom decisions. I want it to be a. I want to you know, help engage student foster discussion. I want the students to learn from each other, to learn from me while I learn from them. 
some influential ideas. You know, these aren't the only ideas that have influenced my curriculum, but it is two big ones that have stuck with me. And one is uh, in Ornstein's paper when he was talking about the different views of the curriculum. I think the one that stuck with me the most was the uh, perennialist view. I think one of my main goals as a, as a teacher in this particular curriculum would be to build their intellectual skills. I don't have as much control over the content because it's uh, because I would have to be teaching to an, a test created by the college board. But what I do have control over is what skills I what intellectual skills I want to teach the students. And so that's what when I design this curriculum, it's built around this idea of okay, which intellectual skills do I want to teach them? And I will talk more about those, uh, which skills in particular in future slides. I also was influenced by uh, John Bergman's flipped classroom theory. And I believe uh, I liked his idea of having the students do stuff on their own and then come back and then discussing that later. That influenced my idea for the, uh, for the homework assignments where every week I will give the students uh, a different primary source that they will go home, read, take notes on. They'll turn in a worksheet to Proof that they actually did it but they will come back the next day we'll have a discussion on the primary sources and what it said hopefully this will foster some critical thinking will foster some skills on how to read a primary source and you know this will lead the students to teach themselves to a certain extent word about curriculum theory right here we are uh, developing this curriculum i definitely used a structure structure oriented state of mind uh, because there is definitely a focus of finding relationships between topics. That is something I tried to emphasize in the different assignments is find your relationships, find how these things are connected, because I think that fosters critical thinking, which is one of those important skills I want them to learn. And ultimately, I don't have that. Again, I don't have that much co control over the content. I'm teaching an AP class based on the recommendations of the college board. So there's not as much focus on which content to include. I was told which content to include. My independence is deciding what skills I want them to learn. And for that reason, I think it's a structurally oriented theme. The unstructured curriculum, you know, it obviously comes in two parts. You got the hidden and the organic curriculum. A big concern for me about the hidden curriculum is when we're covering sensitive topics like Indian removal and slavery. Uh, something I would want to do is cover historical arguments people made both in favor and against uh, those practices, but, you know, covering arguments in favor of those evil practices could come off somewhat like approval, if not handled delicately. Uh, you could have students coming away with positive views or maybe neutral views of those things, which is not what you want. What I want is for them to see the positive views to internalize how someone could rationalize uh, defending something like that. And so I think the solution to that is to just make sure you cover all the brutal aspects of Indian removal and slavery, all the terrible things that happened as a result of those policies and practices. So that way the students do come away with a negative view of those things. So I guess the solution is to take the hidden curriculum and make it part of the, you know, explicit instruct inst structured curriculum. As for the organic curriculum, it's just skills like how to keep up with deadlines, how to organize and use proper grammar on a paper, how to learn through multiple formats of instruction, and how to present an argument you disagree with. Basic stuff like that. Theory. Next up, we got our trends that are going on in social studies curricula all across this country. You know, historically, there hasn't been very much focus on real life skills in social studies and history classes. There has been this idea that you show up, you sit down, and the teacher just tells you what happened, and then you go home knowing what happened. Uh, I think there's more to it than just that. Um, there's been a more recent trend recently where people have been, where teachers have been trying to teach skills such as media literacy, problem solving, flexible and critical thinking, and the ability to form a persuasive argument. Uh, those are definitely trends that I try to take into account in this proposed curriculum, including this focus on reading and interpreting primary sources. I think that develops uh, more critical thinking skills. And I also try to include a focus on group projects. Every unit in this curriculum has its own group project, so we can teach uh, some cooperation skills. Dent. Taking a look at the Ohio State Standards, basically what the Ohio Standards do is that they specify a set of standards for eighth graders, where eighth graders are supposed to take American history from the beginning up through 1877, and then generally sophomores in high school take American history from 1877 to the present. The problem is 
when you're in eighth grade, you can't take an AP class. And when you're taking an AP class in high school, that can't just cover 1877 to the present. It has to cover all of American history because all of American history is going to be on the AP test. And so because this uh, proposed curriculum is covering the first half of the year, it is going to be focused on standards set for eighth graders um, in covering American history up through 1877. But more so than the Ohio State standards, there is going to be a focus on following the standards set up by the College Board for its AP tests. So then these are the 14 content statements that the Ohio standards specify that students learning American history up through 1877 should know. I'm not going to sit here and read all 14 of them. They're right there for you if you want to pause this and read them yourself. But there is some good stuff there for uh, in terms of knowing the difference between primary and secondary sources, uh, knowing what happened to the Native Americans, uh, the stuff about slavery, about the Enlightenment, about how the colonies developed, about how they gained their independence, the establishment of the Constitution, the Civil War, Manifest Destiny, Reconstruction, all that kind of stuff. Some quick background knowledge about the topics of interest covered in this curriculum. It does assume some background knowledge in areas such as history, geography, economics, and government. Um, it's nothing too advanced, but there is sort of an assumption going into this class that you know for example, the three branches of government that you know, the House of Representatives and Senate, when we're talking about the Constitutional Convention and how that is set up, there is an assumption that you know what the final outcome is, or at least the basic structure of it. Geography, it's nothing too detailed, but I do expect you to be able to, for example, point to Texas on a map. You know, when we're talking about the Mexican-American War, you should have a general idea what area of the country we're talking about. Economics, we might cover some stuff like how the panics of 1819 and 1837 happened, just some basic stuff like supply and demand. And even if students don't know that, I think the curriculum is flexible enough to refresh students or teach them for the first time those topics as through the process of regular instruction. And then a quick word about the units of the curriculum. This is a hypothetical plan that would hypothetically be implemented in the upcoming 24 through 25 school year. I did specify some dates. Those are some dates for later in 2024, essentially. It was created with an all-year class, but this presentation only covers the first semester, and it was created according to the guidelines of the College Board. The College Board separates this into nine different units of history for American history, so we're covering the first five in the first semester. And then in the second semester, they would hypothetically cover the next four and then review for the AP test at the end. Each unit starts with a brief pre-assessment, you know, nothing more than 20 minutes to finish. You know, it'll be really short just so I can gauge prior knowledge, see where everyone is going into this, see if there's anything maybe everyone already knows or see what people don't know as much about. I should emphasize more on um, each unit will be three to four weeks, except the first one kind of depends on how much content there is to cover. Every week will involve a homework assignment involving reading a primary source document while you're at home and then coming in the next day with interpretations and a discussion about it. You know, I discussed that a little bit earlier. Every unit will have a group and individual project except for the first unit because that one's a bit shorter than all the others. And the group projects will vary. I want that. I want the group projects to vary to give the different students with different talents an opportunity to shine. The individual projects will be the same every time, but they have some autonomy over it. It's a two-page biography about any American figure from that time period covered in the unit. With each period, uh, having a list of figures students are not allowed to cover because they are already too well known. And there won't be that many of these figures, but ultimately, if you're covering George Washington, I'm afraid that you won't learn that much on your own, that you're just going to learn stuff we've already covered in class. Everyone knows who George Washington is. Why don't we make it interesting? Cover someone people don't know as well. That's my mentality going into this. And the paper would have three parts. You're covering a biography. You're covering what their beliefs are and what impact they had on the history of this country. Instruction. There is a unit zero. This is just the first week of classes, 26th through 30th of August. This is just introductions. Everyone getting to know each other. I would have the students fill out a worksheet, a questionnaire about themselves. I want to know about their background, interests, hobbies, future ambitions, and what they hope to get out of the class. Plus what, you know, what historical eras and people particularly interest them. I think that'll give me some good background knowledge that I could then, you know, cater the curriculum, the instruction, the lesson plans to what interests them and hopefully engage them a bit more than they would otherwise. 
This will also be my opportunity to overview the curriculum and set expectations for what they are expected to do and learn. And there will be an assignment to um, teach them about primary versus secondary sources. They will have to read, um, I'll give them 10 paragraph long sources to read on their own. And they must determine if they are primary or secondary sources. Come back the next day, we'll have a discussion, get uh, set some expectations so they have a good idea of what the rest of the year is going to look like. Unit one is also only one week because it, there's not as much content to cover here as there is in the other ones. It's 1492 through 1607, obviously from when Christopher Columbus first arrived in the New World to the establishment of Jamestown. It will cover, you know, his, his voyages, Spanish Florida, and the failed English colony at Roanoke. A little bit of other things too, but those are the main three. You know, stuff like Hernan Cortez's conquest of the Aztecs. You know, that is that is important historical knowledge, but that didn't happen in the United States. So there won't be as much to cover for this particular week. There will be one summative assessment and it'll just be a simple quiz given on that Friday. 20 multiple choice questions and an extended response where students have to write about the impact of the Columbian exchange. And they have the choice to write between its impact on food, culture, diseases, the balance of power in Europe or on Native Americans. Unit 2, this will be three weeks, 1607 through 1754. It covers the from the establishment of Jamestown through the beginning of the French and Indian War, or the Seven Years' War. Week 1 will focus on the founding of Jamestown and Plymouth, sort of the big two, the first two successful English colonies in what is now the United States. Uh, week 2 will focus on the development of slavery and white relationships with Native Americans. That's something I want to have a focus on throughout this curriculum is, you know, that's kind of the two great evils of America's founding is slavery and Indian removal. This will cover the beginnings of those. Week three will focus on the emergence of colonies like Maryland, Rhode Island, and Georgia. Colonies that do have particularly interesting founding stories. And then, but ultimately I think every colony, I'd like every colony to have some coverage in this class. So what I'm doing is that the group project is going to be that the class is going to be divided into 13 groups. Some people might have to work as individuals if there's less than 26 people in the class, but each group is going to give, be giving a presentation on the third week on how one of the original American colonies was founded. There'll, there will be one colony for each group. The individual projects will be due uh, Friday at the end of the second week where the students are covering figures. Uh, I decided not to put any figures off limits here because I don't think any American figures uh, from this time period of history are super well known, except for maybe Pocahontas. But Pocahontas is one of the few prominent women in American history like, who is super well known, household name from this era. Especially when you're talking about women of color, there's just not that many historical figures who are super well known to the American public. And so I would feel wrong taking one of those few women who are well-known saying you can't cover her. So you can cover Pocahontas. Unit three is going to be four weeks long because this is covering a lot. It's going all the way from the beginning of the French and Indian War all the way through the end of John Adams' presidency. Week one is covering the Seven Years' War and the lead up to the American Revolution Week two, there will be a focus on Enlightenment philosophies that motivated the Founding Fathers, as well as how that resulted in the Declaration of Independence, and some stuff about the Revolutionary War itself. Week three will cover the failures of the Articles of Confederation and the drafting of the current U.S. Constitution. And then week four will cover the presidencies of George Washington and John Adams. Uh, the, for this one unit, the group projects and individual assignments will be combined into one because there's so much content to cover. And I kind of came up with something that would incorporate both of them. Bas basically, I'm going to do a mock constitutional convention where everyone will be assigned a, a founding father who attended the constitutional convention, and they'll have to do their own research on what that founding father believed, what arguments they made about the different uh, compromises that were discussed at the constitutional convention. That will be their individual work, is drafting those arguments. And then the group project will be coming in on a on a specified day and holding that discussion, holding that mock convention and basically trying to dish out something about uh, what compromises you should reach when drafting a U.S. Constitution. And then unit four is also four weeks because it's also covering a lot all the way from uh, the beginning of Thomas Jefferson's presidency 
all the way through uh, the end of the Mexican-American War. Week one, we'll cover the Jefferson presidency and the War of 1812. Week two, we'll cover the era of good feelings and the emergence of the two-party system under Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren. Week three, we'll cover slavery, Indian removal, and the Second Great Awakening. Week four, we'll cover the Mexican-American War. Uh, for their individual projects, the only two figures I've decided are off-limits are Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson. Basically, if they're on the money, they're too prominent to write about. Uh, the group project will be groups of four or five people pretending it's 1800 and creating the proposals of which land the United States should annex, using historical justifications and counterfactuals for why the land was rightfully American. The idea behind this is I like to, I think you can learn a lot through counterfactuals. There's a lot of land like, you know, modern day British Columbia, Baja, California, the Yucatan Peninsula, Cuba, which uh, various U.S. politicians at the time proposed annexing for various motivations, various reason, reasons. A lot of them almost were annexed. And so I think it can be helpful to look at these counterfactuals uh, to understand the mindset behind Manifest Destiny and annexation. So that would be the point of that group project. And then the last two days of the week before Thanksgiving will be reserved in case we don't finish the lessons by the 20th. It will be uh, time to cover what we haven't already covered. But if we do finish everything in time, then it will be a great time to review the content. Tution. And then we'll finish out the semester with Unit 5, which will cover all the way from the end of the Mexican-American War to the end of Reconstruction, with the first week covering the build-up to the Civil War with, you know, a focus on the Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the Dred Scott decision, and John Brown's raid. And then the second week, we'll cover the Civil War itself, basically with kind of a focus on Lincoln from his election to his assassination, which approximates the duration of the war. The third week, we'll quickly address Reconstruction, how it ended, and then there will be some time for review and some time to take the final. What I'm thinking, this could be adjusted according to how much time we have left, but what I was thinking was one and a half days dedicated to a review of the semester based on what students have struggled based with based on what I've been able to determine from the formative and summative assessments. And then a midterm, they'll have a day and a half to take that. The midterm will be in lieu of a summative assessment at the end of the unit. The people off limits for the individual assignments this unit are Abraham Lincoln, John Wilkes Booth, and Robert E. Lee. Uh, the group assignments will be a class classroom-wide debate on secession in the second week. Basically, I will divide the students up into four groups. Uh, pro-secessionist Virginians, anti-secessionist Virginians, and then representatives from the Union and Confederacy. It will take the, the uh, position as a mock debate uh, between a meeting of the Virginia State Legislature on whether or not they should secede and join the Confederacy. And then each group will be required to work together ahead of time to understand and reiterate arguments the group would have historically used, and then turn in a group worksheet with work cited to you know prove that they did their homework with all that. And that way they can uh, get a chance to engage with each other to learn how to make a persuasive argument, how to respond to counterattacks, how to make those kinds of arguments. And I think it could it could be fun and we'll have a they'll be able to learn in the process. And then a quick word on how the assessments will go uh, for the summative assessments. They'll be administered on the last Friday of every unit. And then if a student's absent that day, they could just reach out to me, email me, however they want. Let's go to another time to take it. I'll try to keep my schedule open for that. Uh, every summative assessment except the first one will feature 40 multiple choice questions, three short responses, and an essay question to mimic the format of the AP test, and then you have all day to take it. Each essay will have three or four prompts that the students can choose from. The students will be told ahead of time what the prompts are so they can prepare. Uh, and then the students will serve, uh, the assessments will serve as a way to prepare the students for the actual AP test and will be graded like an AP test. I will give the students back a score a percentage score out of 100, but they will also get a number one through five to mimic what scores they would receive on the AP test. And then the midterm, midterm will be longer, 60 multiple choice questions, five short responses, but still only one essay. I kind of wanted to do two, but I figure there might not be enough time. You could only push the students so hard. And then basically everything else, individual assignments, group projects, student participation, homework, and in-class activities will all act as informal formative assessments. I will use that to gauge how well the class is learning and adjust, um, adjust the instruction accordingly.
And then this is an example of a rubric for the uh, the individual assignment, the one where the students are supposed to write about a historical figure. Uh, it's out of 30 points. Obviously, the, uh, the assignment has three sections, the biography, the part about the figure's beliefs and what impact they had on history. That's what's being graded here. They're also being graded on accuracy, how many sources they used, and proper grammar and punctuation. As for what skills I want my students to learn, we got the three categories here, basic, mastery, and enrichment. The basic skills, stuff that all students should know. I'm thinking cooperation skills, the ability to formulate an argument, and proper grammar in an essay. Especially at the high school level, I think those are things that all students should know. Mastery, I'm trying to explicitly teach them how to uh, decipher meaning from a primary source, reframe historical arguments in their own words, and I want them to be able to independently find reliable sources. That is stuff that would be part of the curriculum, things necessary for them to know. Although where I'm going above and beyond, I think, is I'm teaching them the skills on how to explore historical counterfactuals and defend arguments that they disagree with, especially with the group assignments. They're going to be assigned, some of them are going to be assigned some arguments they definitely disagree with, and they're going to have to defend them. I think that is an important skill in fostering critical thinking, fostering a certain amount of media literacy, just how to formulate an argument and just be able to defend it even if you disagree with it. This curriculum does try to take into account culturally relevant teaching, culturally relevant uh, leadership, and the practices thereof. I do strongly believe in that. I think that's a great way for students to see themselves represented in the curriculum. And that's what the questionnaires are for at the beginning of the semester. That's so I can know what information students are willing to share, what information about themselves they will want reflected explicitly in the instruction of the curriculum. But it can be difficult to know ahead of time what they would want, especially like you don't know, you might not know ahead of time what demographics will be represented in the classroom. Uh, depending on the area, you might have a good idea, but you never know which uh, one off student who's uh, the only member of their cultural minority will be represented in the classroom. So that's something that you have to have the flexibility to account for ahead of time. One thing I do want to explicitly plan for is how to incorporate women into the curriculum, because no matter where you're teaching, you're going to have women in the classroom. You're going to have girls. And I think it's good that they see themselves represented in the curriculum. So that's something I'd like to plan for. And I think the individual projects also give the students an opportunity to research someone from that time period of their own cultural background who might not otherwise be covered anywhere in the curriculum. So that could give the students a good opportunity to, to do their own research and represent themselves in the curriculum. And then this curriculum also does provide an opportunity for all six levels of Bloom's taxonomy to be represented. At a level one, there would just be students be repeating back information to me. An example of that would be if I'd asked them what year did the Boston Massacre happen, they just repeat that back to me. And then, you know, it's not always important to know exactly when things happen, but you do need a general idea of the timeline and geographic location for where and when things happened. At the second level, there is uh, there are more complicated questions. It might still even just be multiple choice, but for this one, it would be a question such as, why did the French help the United States during the Revolutionary War? And that might come through the homework assignments or reading the primary sources or their individual projects. A level three application, that could be done through group discussions and projects. An example of that would just be, I think, the Virginia Project, where they're discussing as if they're members of the Virginia State Legislature. I think that would be level three. Level four analysis, the example of that would probably be the short answer questions on the summative assessment designed to encourage categorization and analysis. That would be something like, maybe I give you a description of an unspecified state you tell me whether or not that state is more likely to be a slave state or a free state based on what you know and back up your claim, something like that. At level five, at the, at the synthesis level, that might be something like the essay on a typical summative assessment, asking students to combine elements from uh, different instructions, defend their arguments, evaluate arguments. It would be something like, here are some arguments Andrew Jackson and his allies made in uh, defense of Indian removal. Uh, tell me which ones are likely to be genuine and which ones are just kind of they made for political purposes to cover their true intentions and then defend your argument. It would be something like that. 
And then level six at the evaluation level, that would probably just be the essay on the midterm to reach this pinnacle of understanding, asking them to make a value judgment. So that might be something like, here's an argument someone made defending slavery, uh, make a comparison between that and an argument someone might make about a contemporary issue. So that's all six levels of Bloom's taxonomy represented here. And then this is a curriculum map. Just kind of shows uh, the different, the 14 different content statements. Uh, you can go back to slide number 10 to see what which each content statement means here. But you know, there's going to be a lot of review. There's going to be a lot of mastery. Some of the mastery will happen over the course of multiple units, but I think every little thing will get an opportunity to be reviewed at some point. In terms of professional development, I hope to receive help from other other history teachers, uh, both those that I meet through the school and the ones I meet through professional learning communities. I do believe in professional learning communities as an opportunity for decentralized leadership and help. And then further professional development would come from teacher evaluations and opportunities provided and encouraged by the school district. I am also a strong believer in distributed leadership, as there have been studies that have provided evidence for its effectiveness. Yeah, I hope to develop professionally through these opportunities that the school district would hopefully provide. In terms of how I want to be evaluated, I think what's most important to me is student success. I will be teaching to an AP test, so that provides a very objective way of measuring how successful students are. Uh, I think, in my opinion, if the students are doing well in the AP test and they enjoy the class, then I think the curriculum has been successful. There's always room for improvement, but I think I've succeeded if I've accomplished those two goals. So I'll look at their test, I'll look at their end of class evaluations, and we'll see uh, what they think from that. Obviously, the curriculum does still need to be evaluated by the school administration, and I think in, that, in terms of that, I like the uh, eclectic approach suggested by uh, Glathorne and uh, their colleagues textbook that combines the models of Tyler, Stuffelbeam, Stake, Eisner, and Bradley. I think it's a simple model, but it's effective. Some strengths of the curriculum I haven't mentioned already. It is It does have a relatively consistent schedule with activities generally due on Friday and each unit having the same overall structure. I know that's something that helps me uh, when all the when the deadlines are different days, that can be very confusing for me. So I want to provide that for my students a consistent schedule. Uh, the variety of group projects will give the students a chance to work in different areas of talent and strength. And then I have high expectations for every student. That's something you need to do. The projects and assignments that will teach skills such as critical thinking, cooperation, and media literacy, as well as problem solving and how to create an argument. And then it provides opportunities for students to take control of the learning and exercise autonomy, especially through those individual assignments. And then some weaknesses of the curriculum. You know, we all have to be self-reflective. We all have to acknowledge there's no such thing as a perfect curriculum. So where are the possible weaknesses here? From what I've been able to tell, I think one of my biggest criticisms would be the fact that it is an AP class and you do have to teach the test, which gives me a little less flexibility. So the central purpose of the curriculum would be preparing students for the test. And then that means other skills kind of do have to be an afterthought. That doesn't mean they're not important, but they do have to be secondary to the central purpose of the classroom, which is making sure the students pass the AP test. And because I have less control over what content to include, it could be harder to justify the students why it's important. If they ask why they have to learn something, it will be difficult to give an answer besides just it's on the test. And I think the way to ameliorate, ameliorate that is to relate the content to their own lives. So they're just less likely to ask that question in the first place. And it's harder and easier to answer if they do. And ultimately, there is just so much content to be covered here. This is a subject I'm passionate about. I fear that I might get too carried away, uh, too stuck on the same topic and go too in depth. And you, I may have to make sacrifices or move content that I think it is important just to make sure we get everything we need to in the class. And there isn't as much flexibility for students of lower academic ability. I, there is some flexibility for that, but I think there is some idea that maybe a student of lower academic ability is less likely to just take an AP class in the first place. So that does reinforce the um, the different courses that, that schools will set up for their students. It reinforces the idea of having a different uh, course load for students of higher academic abilities, even though there have been studies that have demonstrated that it's better when you combine the students of different academic abilities. So this does reinforce some of that. and. And I don't like that, but 
ultimately the only way to cover that is to provide some more flexibility for students of lower academic abilities. And I think this curriculum might be able to cover for. And here are my sources. Thank you for listening to this presentation. I look forward to seeing what everyone else has put down and I hope you guys enjoyed it.